how deeply honored I am to be receiving the AATCC only medal and joining the distinguished scientists who have previously received this prestigious award. It has capped my career. I regret very much not being able to be present today. I'm sure you're all having a great conference and I wish I could have been there with you. There have been enormous improvements in textile finishes and dyes since I began working in the 1950s. The variety of fibres being manufactured now are greater also. Additionally, analytical instruments available to the textile chemist are much better. Helping me to keep up with the changes as they were happening, the AATCC was an excellent source for information during my teaching and research career. Although I cannot be present to give the only presentation, I am fortunate that one of my finest students at UC Davis has graciously agreed to give it in my place, namely Dr. Ellison. One of the many attributes he has, which I particularly admired when he was at Davis, was his ability to build the instruments he required for his research on the mechanical properties of fibers. This is a talent that not everyone has. Mike, after completing his research at Davis, joined the faculty at Clemson University, where he has had a distinguished career and is now a professor emeritus in the Department of Materials Science and Engineering and still maintains an active research program. Among his interests are biologically inspired materials. The, nature, the study of natural systems for inspiration in new materials development. He considers the filaments produced by spiders as the most promising model of an advanced material manufactured by a sustainable method. As I leave the stage to Dr. Ellison to give the presentation, I want to thank the ATCC for awarding me the only medal. Thank you very much. And I have a script that was written by him. Uh, those of you who know me know that I'm not a cellulose chemist, so I would not try to wing this as I do some other talks. Uh, I tried to change this to put it in the right sort of pronoun thing where instead of I, I would say Hague and that sort of thing. And I decided that was not keeping, in keeping with his talk, and so I left it in the form of uh, uh, the pronouns when he wrote it. So when I say my interests were broad during my career, that's Haig talking, not me, okay? So you might, after a while you'll catch on. It's not me talking, it's Haig. And I'm really honored to be here. Haig's Ronian had a very strong influence on my life, needless to say. Okay, uh, here we go, beginning. My interests were broad during my career. I studied both natural and manufactured fibers and researched in many areas, including pyrolysis, flammability, cross-linking, and weathering. My work on cellulose included studies in which the starting products were cotton, ramy, viscous rayon, microcrystalline cell cellulose, and rice straw. In this presentation, I will focus on the research I was involved with on cellulose fibers. Mostly I will be discussing the changes in the fine structure of cotton induced by swelling, the effect of heat treatments on this fiber, cellulose water relations, and finally the porosity and surface area of cotton. In the 1950s, when I first started working on property of cotton cellulose, the conventional way of making amorphous cellulose was to ball mill it. This destroyed the fiber structure. Swelling treatments were known to change crystallinity, but it had not been determined how extensively and how substantially the modification would affect fiber properties. The, the terms accessibility and amorphousness were used synonymously at that time. The values for crystallinity ranged from 39 to 95 percent, depending on the technique used to determine it. Cotton has the cellulose one crystal form. Mercerization will convert it to the cellulose two crystal form and amine or liquid ammonia treatments can yield cellulose 3. The conversion in these cases can be done with little or no degradation. However, while the cellulose 4 form was known to exist, nothing could be deduced about fiber properties since at that time it was thought that conversion required heating the cellulose at high temperatures such as 260 cellulose, cellulose <laughs> centigrade 
uh, in glycerol. Under such conditions, the fiber structure degraded. Also, the mechanism by which cellulose fibers fractured under tensile stress needed further elucidation. I should clarify here that when I refer to mercerized products, I mean cotton fibers with a cellulose one crystal form that have been treated with a solution of an alkaline metal hydroxide of sufficient strength to cause essentially complete conversion of the lattice structure to the cellulose two form. First, I will discuss reduction in crystallinity of cotton cellulose by swelling. The initial reason I study this was that it was hypothesized by my research director at the Shirley Institute, where I was employed at the time, that by decrystallizing cotton, one might be able to transform its stress strain curve from being almost linear up to the breakpoint to that of cellulose acetate, which has a marked yield point. Consequently, it was thought that this would give a cotton similar, good cotton, a similar draping ability to that of cellulose acetate. My initial attempts at decrystallization were to swell it with anhydros, anhydrous ethylamine and then wash with water. I found the change in crystallinity was relatively small and it had little effect on fiber properties. It appeared that extraction of the ethylamine by water resulted in recrystallization of the cellulose. I had better success when I kept the fiber structure open by imparting a small degree of acetylation after the fiber had been swollen in ethylamine, then solvent exchanging the ethylamine with pyridine, then acetylating in pyridine before washing with water and drying. This was true of any swelling agent I tried before and after I left the Shirley Institute. These swelling agents were ethylamine, methylamine, and mercerizing strength alkali metal hydroxide solution. The mercerizing solution was prepared in both water and in alcohol. We followed the structural changes induced by these swelling treatments by studying the rate of acetylation of the products by comparison with X-ray diffractograms. We also determined such properties as accessibility by moisture regain determination and tensile properties. So on the effect of acetylation of cellulose, the first, the lower um, curve there is cotton and uh, it was in uh, it was simply dunked in the acetylation mixture without swelling in ethylamine first. Curve two is ethylamine treated, then washed. In this case, the cotton would be pre-swollen in ethylamine, then water washed to remove the ethylamine and not allowed to dry before acetylation. In curve three, the cotton has been uh, pre-swollen in ethylamine, then washed with pyridine rather than water, to remove the ethylamine and kept in the pyridine uh, before acetylation. So you can see that the cur top curve, the ethylamine treated, pyridine washed, and then acetylated has the uh, highest acetyl content as a function of uh, treatment time. The X-ray diffraction of acetylated cellulose follows this sort of pattern where the first slide uh, first slide. The first trace there of cotton, number one, is just plain cotton x-ray diffraction and you can see the 101 and 101 bar peaks there at about 14 and 16. And as the acetyl, as the treatment goes from ethylamine treated with water washed uh, to ethylamine treated with pyridine washed, the, uh, the uh, 101 and 101 bar uh, diffract diffraction peaks go away and the uh, uh, the, very, the, uh, 22 degree, the peak of 22 degrees becomes very broad. Okay. So on this one, you can, we are to compare the treatment, the uh, changes uh, in treatment on moisture regain. The acetyl contents are about the same of the three that are not, not, not the first one clearly, but and you can see what happens with the different moisture regains so that the swelling maintains, uh, there's a here, the column I'm talking about. So when it's washed with water, it's not as open and washed with pyridine, it's more, has a more open. And uh, 
This uh, the tensile properties slide is relatively busy. You know, the MWD mass, you know, from, uh, <laughs> mass weapons of destruction. Mercerized, water washed, and dried. MWP is mercerized, water washed, purity, and exchange. <coughs> MEP is mercerized, ethanol washed, purity, and exchange. So there's a whole series of treatments down through here. And the biggest elongation, or biggest breaking load is in here, but the most remarkable elongation to break was about 16%, and that's about the best that was, that was given, that was, that was obtained, I'm sorry. And these data tend to show that the uh, recrystallization with water, the recrystallization of the cotton when it is washed with water. But if it's been esterified with a small amount of in the, if, if it had been esterified, a small amount, in the never dried, pyridine exchanged state, the product will not recrystallize as much. Also, when a never dried product is reacted with a reagent, the reagent will penetrate the fiber far more uniformly, and for the equivalent degree of substitution, the fiber properties will differ sharply from a fiber that is reacted without this pre swelling. So in retrospect, it is difficult to introduce a marked yield point in the tensile properties of cotton. Cellulose acetate has a very large, uh, has a very little crystallinity and low fiber orientation. Its extensibility is high, uh, cellulose acetate 25 to 45 percent, and its degree of polymerization is only 200 to 250. In contrast, as I will discuss later, Cotton has a very high crystallinity, around 90%, and a much higher degree of polymerization, greater than 2,000 normally. In addition, cotton has a complex morphology. Specifically, the cellulose molecules spiral around the fiber axis, and the periodic reversal of the spiral in the secondary wall results in convolutions. While the swelling treatment such as slack mercerization will reduce crystallinity, the decrease is not large, from about 90% to 80%. Slack mercerization can increase strength and extensibility. I attributed the changes induced by mercerization in part to the swelling induced by the process, causing the fibers to untwist. Simultaneously, the internal stresses, which may be concentrated in regions where the convolution reversals occur, are relieved. The reduction in crystalline length that occurs on mercerization, roughly 66%, as well as the reduction in overall degree of crystallinity, contributes to this relief of stresses in the fiber, as well as giving a product, as well, giving a product a higher extensibility. The increased extensibility is due to greater mobility of the crystallites as their size is reduced and by the increased amount of amorphous material. <coughs> However, in contrast to cellulose acetate, mercerized cotton has high crystallinity and orientation as well as a relatively low extensibility, around 12%. Mercerized cotton also has a relatively high secant modulus and rupture energy. Secant modulus is a measure of fiber rigidity. So we also measured the breaking twist angle, which is a measure of brittleness of cotton samples before and after slack mercerization and of acetate rayon. We found that the acetate rayon was the least brittle. None of the decrystallization techniques we tried gave us an extensibility above 16% as previously noted and all retained a significant amount of crystalline product at acetyl contents of 10%. While the drapeability issue was not resolved, the research enabled a better understanding of the effect of various swelling agents on the reactivity of cellulose and on the physical properties and accessibility of cotton fibers. Next, I turn to thermal properties. Much processing of cellulose materials requires heat treatments. The question arises then, is there a glass transition temperature, T sub G, for cellulose even though it is a highly crystalline hydrogen bonded product? Second order transitions have been reported by several workers for cellulose of the various forms with values ranging up to 240 degrees. Uh, so you can see in this slide, 
<coughs> excuse me, it's measured on dry cellulose. And there are different types of transitions seen. Low temperatures is attributed to the motion of restricted segments of polymer chains or side groups at 200 degrees and higher. It's attributed to either T sub G or crystal melting. And also note that they did uh, on many different types of cotton products. I obtained a value for T sub G of 160 degrees for Ramey using a torsion pendulum built by Dr. Emery Menifee. I used Ramey as a model fiber for cotton because it has a less complex morphology. My T sub G of 160 was lower than that of the other wor workers. As far as data implying T sub G is above 200, I have my doubts about such claims because dehydrocellulose is formed at 220 degrees cellulose, uh, Celsius. Later we looked at the brittleness of Ramey fibers and found it became less brittle at about 190 degrees. Also working with cotton yarn, we found its modulus decreases about 180. And its rate of stress decay increased at about 200 degrees. Thus, a T sub G of about 160 is reasonable for cotton. Manufacturing of cotton products can result in conversion of its crystal structure from cellulose 1 to cellulose 2, mercerization, or to cellulose 3. Products containing the cellulose 4 structures are not found normally in commercial products because the high temperatures required to cause the conversion are avoided since fiber degradation occurs. However, we found we could cause conversion without excessive damage by heating in formamid or steam at 120 C. We compared properties of a starting cotton to cotton after transformation of the crystal form to cellulose 2 by mercerization, to cellulose 3 by ethylamine treatment, and to cellulose 4 from the cotton, cellulose 3 cotton. Although DP fell in comparison to the control when cellulose 4 was formed from 3350 to 2200. Essentially, all of it occurred during the ethylamine treatment. Some weight loss occurred during cellulose 4 formation, roughly about 8%. Accessibility increased as indicated by moisture regain and by water retention value determinations by about 40% and 20% respectively. Here. Um, <clears throat> level off degree of polymerization, LODP, which is a measure of crystalline length in cellulose 4 cotton, had decreased from 60 to 165 for the starting product and was close to that of uh, mercerized cotton. Fiber strength was comparable to that of the starting cotton, even though its DP was lower. Thus, cellulose 4 cotton um, retained the strength of the native cotton, but had higher accessibility. This is a really busy slide, but it points out the uh, uh, change in fiber strength. In addition, it had a smoother surface when found when fibers were examined by scanning electron microscopy. So here, the, the, of course, this is not 2550 times, or X 2550, because it's blown up on the screen, but that's what it was on the uh, original slide. But you can compare the difference there uh, between the, the, uh, uh, the two and the same thing here. Excuse me. Much work has been done to study the interaction of water and cotton because of its importance in industrial processing. In this regard, I will describe our work on moisture uptake, accessibility, hysteresis, surface area, and cotton porosity. We studied the moisture adsorption of amorphous cellulose formed by deacetylating acetate filament and 1% sodium hydroxide in ethanol. We also tried the method on cotton by preparing a fully acetylated fiber without dissolution and re-spinning, thereby keeping the fiber intact, and then 
without dissolution and respinning. Oh, okay. Thereby keeping the fiber intact. And then desettling with the sodium hydroxide ethanol reagent. The product was not completely amorphous, so I called it disordered cotton. In addition to the amorphous cellulose and the disordered cotton, we measured the sorption isotherms of the starting cotton and mercerized cotton. We also measured the sorption isotherms of microcrystalline products prepared for each product. We analyzed the water sorption data using the BET equation, which adequately describes the sorption of water vapor in celluloses below 0.5 relative vapor pressure, RVP. We calculated the number of molecules of water absorbed per anhydroglucose unit and hydroglucose unit AGU when a monomolecular mono layer of water was formed on the amorphous cellulose W sub M. It was about 0.8 moles per AGU for amorphous cellulose, even though there are three hydroxyl groups per anhydroglucose unit AGU. So uh, C in this case is the cotton. Uh, M is mercerized cotton, AD is deacetylated rayon, CAD is deacetylated, fully acetylated cotton. So you have fully acetylated cotton and then you deacetylate it. The H indicates the sample had been acid hydrolyzed, hydrolyzed to form the microcrystalline, that is LODP cellulose. And we contrast here the W sub M up here of the different samples and also the effective molecular contact area, that is their surface area. The H samples were used to calculate the crystallinity and accessibility of the samples. So using the data for amorphous cellulose, we proposed relations for calculating the crystallinity and accessibility of the, what, wait a Calculated, uh, we proposed relation for calculated crystallinity and accessibility of cellulose fibers. For our cotton, mercerized, mercerized cotton, and disordered cotton. 20. We determined their crystallinity to be 0 0.91, 0 0.79, and 0.39, respectively, and their accessibility as uh, 0 0.37, 0 0.52, and 0 0.78, respectively. Those values for the crystallinity of cotton and mercerized cotton are close to values obtained by the acid hydrolysis technique. We also considered the causes of, micro, of moisture regain hysteresis. In this work, a comparison was made between the BET and the Guggenheim, Anderson, and De Boer GAB relation for evaluating adsorption isotherms. The GAB relation fitted the absorption isotherms up to a relative moist vapor pressure, RVP, of 0.9, whereas the BET fitted only up to an RVP of 0.5. <clears throat> the GAB relation appeared to have been overlooked by cellulose chemists at that time. Using this relation, W sub M was determined to be 0.9 moles per AGU for amorphous cellulose. At least three hypotheses have been put forward for explaining hysteresis. We discounted two and tested the third, which states that the internal pressure generated as a material swells or contracts affects the amount of water absorbed. Thus, whenever there is mechanical hysteresis, there must also be moisture hysteresis. On the other hand, if elastic recovery is good, there will be little moisture hysteresis. We concluded from a study in which we examined the elastic recovery, stress relaxation, and mechanical energy loss of viscose rayon and cross-linked rayon, that the relations between the mechanical hysteresis and sorption hysteresis was not simple. Of the three, uh, of the three mechanical properties we measured, only stress relaxation at low stresses appeared to uh, correlate well with sorption hysteresis. <clears throat> so the uh, VROS over here is the starting rayon. VR2S and VR6S are treated rayons of different DHDHEU content. What? Oh. 
Uh, and <laughs> that one, uh, it's carboxymethyl treated <clears throat> rayon in acid form, excuse me. <clears throat> we determined the surface area of cotton and slack and mercerized, tension mercerized cotton using direct blue one as well as water as a probe. Direct blue one is absorbed at low concentrations in a Langmuirian way. Oh, what? 23. Oh, 23. That was the summary slide there. Okay. Allowing surface areas to be determined using the size of the dye molecule calculated to be 240 times 10 to the minus 20th meters squared. The values for cotton and slack mercerized cotton were 17.7 and 33.7 square meters per gram, respectively. In contrast, the surface area of scoured cotton before and after slack mercerization is 162 meters squared per gram and 226 meters squared per gram, respectively, when determined by water absorption. Uh, if you recall from slide 19 where there was two blue arrows, that's where those two numbers came from. Clearly, the relatively large dye molecule cannot penetrate the small pores that would be accessible to the much smaller water molecule, which has a surface area of only 14.8 times 10 to the minus 20th meter squared. The information provided by the sorption of direct blue one differs from that obtained by the sorption of water. From the data obtained, it was concluded that about 34% of the internal surface of cotton and mercerized cotton available for water sorption is inaccessible to direct blue one. In addition to the presence of pores too small for dyes to penetrate, there may be other factors contributing to the large difference in surface area as measured by dye molecules and water molecules. For example, it is feasible that there are characteristics to the pore and fibrillar surfaces that may not permit an even deposition of the dye molecule. <clears throat> water molecules might be able to position themselves in regions that might be bridged or inaccessible to dye molecules. Also, there is bound water present in cellulose, and if the electrolyte added to the dye solution does not effectively disrupt it, then pore diameters will be smaller. We also studied other dyes to test their suitability as sensors for use as probes in determining fiber surface area. We cautioned in our reports of this research that care has to be taken when selecting a dye to be used as a probe for studies on the accessible surface and pore size of cellulose. Data can be affected by dye structure, dyeing conditions, and substantivity as well as molecular volume. Molecular weight of a dye probe itself does not serve as a good indicator of sensor size for surface area determination. <clears throat> to conclude, cotton and manufactured cellulosic fibers were the first fibers I studied, and in fact, cotton remained a major interest throughout my career. For this reason, I have focused on cotton in this address and given an overview of aspects of the research I have been involved in, of the research I've been involved in, to provide a better understanding of its fine structure and physical properties. The instruments available when I first started working had limited scope and capabilities when compared to what is available today. As instrumentation becomes increasingly advanced, more remains to be discovered about this remarkable fiber. Thank you. <laughs>